Welcome to today's Conversations on Leadership, powered by Life University. I am your host, Dr. Jill Marsh. And as you know, every week I choose a quote that I believe expresses who our guest truly is. And though I have not had the pleasure of knowing this lady, I did speak with someone that does know her. I've looked at her bio, informed myself as to who she is. And I think that this quote actually is quite fitting. And it reads, true leaders always practice the three R's, respect for self, respect for others, and responsibility for all of their actions. Reverend Natasha Reed Rice currently serves as the Associate General Counsel for Real Estate and Finance at Habitat for Humanity International. In this position, she initiates and manages financing programs and strategies to generate sources of capital that enable Habitat affiliates to provide decent, affordable housing to families throughout the United States. In addition to her work at Habitat, Natasha is the founder of Fresh Rain for Life Ministries. And I love that, Fresh Rain for Life and is currently partnering with All Saints Episcopal Church to launch the Faith in the City series. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, join us today, Natasha. I really look forward to this interview as I've looked forward for, for the last couple of weeks since you were actually booked to come on TCL. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation as well. And you know, it, it's just to, to show our friends listening in that leadership sometimes makes mistakes. Uh, Natasha and I ran through the entire interview and I had forgot to press the recording button. So we are starting pretty much fresh and we've got to yeah. know each other a little bit over the last... Okay, we go way back now. Yeah, like 20 minutes at least. <laughs> so we, initially, we started talking about servant leadership because obviously you're a servant leader. And my first question to you would be, when did you know that you were put on this planet to be a servant leader and that you would choose to be a servant leader as your way of earning a living, developing a family, building a community, your life's work? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I would say I had little, I had tendencies young, um, like I, I'm in grade school, I was very, um, uh, very concerned with the underdog, like the, the kid in my class who couldn't speak or who no one wanted to really play with. Like I was very protective of them. And that kind of evolved over time into my interest in social justice issues that really peaked when I was in high school. Um, and in high school, I was very involved in the community and different youth leadership opportunities as well as in the high school and started different clubs at my high school um, to deal with some of those issues and that continued to evolve even into college. Um, so in college I got very involved in racial justice and gender justice issues. Um, we did things like protest and took over University Hall to get an, a valid and legitimate Afro-Am department at Harvard and that brought in um, Professor Henry Louis Gates. Uh, we did quite a few other things on the campus um, and really in that type of um, grassroots community building movement is where I really began to understand leadership a little bit and identify as such. Um, and of course, that's grown um, since then. Unfor college was a long time ago. So, <laughs> you know, hope I have grown some and learned some things and evolved in that understanding. I'll make um, it a little bit better. I graduated from college 45 years ago. Oh, wow. My you don't look it. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wow. And then that's you. So we're still thriving and growing. Though. That's oh, the thing. absolutely. We're continual oh. learners. Oh. Actually. Yeah. And then I'll say, you know, just um, briefly, we'll unpack some more. Um, when I was in law school, I went to law school with an interest in being a civil rights litigator. Um, and that continued to transform into my interest in affordable housing and community economic development and kind of um, went from the litigation interest to the transactional side. But I also began my um, public ministry my first year of law school. So really actively engaged in the tag team of faith and justice and um, connecting hope with action because hope alone is not a strategy and, and really trying to infuse that into um, being a visionary leader, an inspirational leader, a strategic leader. How does instilling hope play a role in your life as a leader of the groups that you lead? Oh, it's, I think it's, it's essential. Um, you know, many leadership experts talk about the difference between a transactional leader and a transformational leader. The transactional leader is good, right? You get things done, you, you, you get your strategy, you have your criteria, your metrics and such, and you, 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 you get all the 
pieces in, in line in order to accomplish whatever that particular goal or shoot for that particular outcome or even that impact. Transformational leader, which I strive to be, um, is one that connects to the hearts and the minds of the people that I, I lead, um, values their humanity, um, encourages and inspires them to stretch beyond what they think they can or cannot do so that we can create some things that have not been created and do some things that have not been done. Um, hope, in my opinion, and faith, and the faith I ascribe to as Christian, but it, I think this can go in an interfaith context, obviously, as well. I do a lot of work in that space. But faith, hope, and hope drives our faith. Um, hope drives our belief that we can get things done. Um, hope is what allows you in those, those, on those bad days when the, 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 you're not hitting your metrics and you're not accomplishing your goals and you're not getting that, that, that effective strategy in place. Hope is what guides you to get, do your best and get up and do it again tomorrow, right? So inst instilling hope is essential in leadership. And so transformational leader, right? Transactional versus transformational. What are the specific qualities that you deem important for a transformational leader? A transformational leader um, has to be visionary. I really believe a transformational leader looks at the current situation, looks at an organization, looks at a community, and looks at, at tackles hard issues and said, I know we may not have seen anyone do this before, but I believe we can accomplish this. And this is what we're going to have to take to accomplish it. They've got to be visionary. They've got to be courageous. But I also think they've got to undergird that with, with sound strategy, with um, a good knowledge base of the folks that you're leading, a good understanding of their, their gifts, their talents, their um, areas where there's need for growth and capacity. And finding a way to also be resourceful, to pull in folks who, that may not be their job title, but that person knows how to get this particular thing done. So a transformational leader is agile, sometimes a disruptor in, in, in an organization, willing to look at innovative um, strategies. I mean, I'm also a lawyer, so I'm also kind of also, I have to mitigate some of that risk. But in mitigating the risk, you don't shut it down. You give some space for there to be some innovation some strong thought, and some edgy work. I like that word, edgy. Um, where does the transactional and transformational leadership styles, where do they intersect so that it creates any and the most amazing type of leadership? So I think a transformational leader works best when they've got some transactional leaders working with them, right? I don't, I'm not, I don't put one over the other. I, I just, I, I think over time I've come to, to understand my giftings um, align better with a transformational leadership style, um, but a transactional leader is essential, right? You need someone who is going to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, who's going to make sure that you're moving forward in your metrics. And not that a transformational, and I'm being very general with this, right? Because you, you can have a mixture of both. Um, but I think that there's a, an important um, partnership between those types of leadership. Some people simplify it and say, you know, like a transformational leader is a, truly is, is a leader and a transactional leader is a good manager. But I think you need both. You need, you need to be able to find ways to integrate the two um, to really create a sound organization. And when we talk about leadership qualities, um, which qualities, I, I think I'd, want to go a little bit deeper on which qualities did you not own that you needed, mm -hmm. that you went out and started cultivating? So I'll just throw out a few qualities that I think are essential, right? In, in being a good leader, um, the ability to listen and reflect, the empathy, having empathy, courage is essential. Um, I think I've always been courageous. Um, I've been empathetic, uh, but I think empathy is also tied to listening. And I'll say that one area I've really had to cultivate uh, in my leadership style has been listening. As you can probably tell, I'm an extrovert. I talk. I, I'm a words person. I'm a lawyer and a preacher. I love words. Um, I process outwardly and I find that I come up with, you know, great ideas and all that, but it's also important to listen and to be mindful of the needs of the people that you're leading, to hear them, because those actually identify 
um, those, those, those needs help to identify goals and metrics and the ability and capacity to accomplish them. And how did you develop that listening skill that you did not own at the beginning? I had to be very intentional. Um, I had to really like caught, tell myself to be quiet, right? Like, and, and when someone, again, as an extrovert, because as I got more mature, realizing everyone in the room is not an extrovert. Like not everyone's going to process the way I process. Not everyone thrives off of, you know, quite a bit of uh, back and forth banter. Some people process inwardly. And so I have to leave space, you know, for that. So I did, did practice that intentionally. Okay. I've, especially on some of my teams now, there have been several folks that are introverted. And I'm like, hey, and I'll call them out specifically by name. What are your thoughts on this? And as you're listening, don't have the conversation in your head of your answer, of your reply, of your defense. Because if you do that, you're really not listening. So it, it literally, you know, you have to almost start at the baseline. Like, okay, I'm listening. I hear you saying da 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 da. This is my thought on that, right? But it, it, you have to slow yourself down enough to actually hear. And when you do that, you let the folks know that, that you value them. You know, I've had some wonderful um, experiences where, and the confirmation that I, I need to do this and that it's important to do this for my team, where I've had some of the introverts come to me, of course, quietly and say, you know what, thank you. Because of that, I now feel like I have a voice. And I mean, to me, that was the greatest success of the year. Right, because it's now and and by doing so, you're uncovering hidden treasure. And well, that that's a beautiful answer to that question. How does answering or asking rather, how does asking provocative questions actually make you a better listener? I think that's a great point. If I could, I'd like to share this. Um, I talked about empathy being one of the other traits, and I recently uh, read an article. It's been reprinted a few times in the Harvard Business Review, and it's entitled Creating a Purpose-Driven Organization. And in it, the authors really talk about the importance of leaders connecting their organization and their employees to a larger purpose, a higher purpose. And when you do that, back to the inspiring hope piece, you inspire them to want to work harder and to do more. And so they say that you don't have to invent this higher purpose that already exists, but you can discover it through empathy by feeling and understanding the deepest common needs of your workforce. And that requires asking provocative questions, listening and re reflecting. And when you do that, people begin to learn and unlearn an organization through create collective creation. Right. So then they go on to say, and I'm going to get to your short answer in a second, but I just think it's important that when when we do that, people who find meaning in their work don't hoard their energy and dedication. The authors found that it gives them it, they give those those ideas and their work freely, defying conventional economic assumptions about self-interest. They grow rather than stagnate. They do more and they do it better. And by tapping into that power, you can transform an entire organization. So asking the provocative question doesn't mean you're necessarily challenging someone as much as you're saying to them, I, I want to hear more from you. Um, we've got a great mission. You're aware of our mission. Use your mission as your standard and say, in order to accomplish that mission right there, I need more input from you. I need to understand what you're thinking about. What are the things that are blocking you from being more involved and engaged? How can we, how can I be a better leader in making sure we pull from you and others the best so that we can accomplish great impact and outcome. I hope that our listeners wrote it down, but if they didn't write it down, that's what I did. I stretched over to my pad and wrote down the article, Create a Purpose-Driven Organization. You said published in the uh, Harvard, Harvard Business Review, correct? Yep, yep. Creating a Purpose-Driven um, Organization. The authors are Robert Quinn and Anjan Thakor, T-H-A-K-O-R. Thank you for sharing that. I will definitely mm -hmm. be uh, using that resource. Yeah. Uh, I know I know. we have a, a, a dead stop because you have another meeting you have got to attend to. Any uh, short words of wisdom as we end this wonderful interview? Yeah, I, I just, I want to encourage folks. Leadership, I think, and my father who trains leaders, um, who basically trained me, he would be one of the folks if I had to say that it was most influential on my leadership style. He always, always says, you know, leaders aren't born, they're, they, they're trained, they're, they're evolved, they learn, they, and it's a constant learning process. It's a constant willingness to take on um, constructive feedback and to try to refine uh, your skill set as a leader because iron 
iron sharpens iron. So you've got to be willing not only to come strong, but to receive strong. And when we do that, we're able to build even in darkness. And when we do, and the light shines again, we've built a fortress. So I just want to encourage all of you out there to um, just continue to learn, to develop your acumen. None of us get it right. I mentioned that one of the areas I've had to grow in is listening. Um, my husband may say I'm not perfect at it, but I think I've gotten a lot better. So I think it's about lessons learned and staying um, inspired and realizing that even if it hasn't been done before, um, it can be done through your leadership. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights and obvious words of wisdom uh, with our audience today. And I will look forward to uh, certainly meeting you. Oh, awesome. That sounds great. Great to meet you. Thank you so much for inviting me to this conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you on.